Romans 8, 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Amen. Then he said, verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Praise God. Freely, with him, freely give us all things. Uh, the Bible said God so loved the world that he gave. So this is what love did. It not only gave us Jesus, but this flow of love towards us gave us all things freely. Whoa! Turn to your neighbor and go with a real deep voice. Whoa! <laughs> Turn to your neighbor on the other side and say, You really believe that? <laughs> Freely gave us all things. Well, then, why are we doing without something that we... <laughs> it's not because God hasn't given it, is it? It's a, it's a matter of us receiving but then he said, verse number, let's read verse 32 again. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What's your part? Whoa. Okay, you didn't get it. Let's read it again, then you do your part. With him freely give us all things. Whoa. You're almost there. Okay, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Oh. That's okay, we'll, we'll let that pass. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love that. I love that. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Okay, right, there's one thing He gave us freely. It's God that justifies. There's so much we could take time to look at, and we're going to spend some time here, but who is He that condemneth? How many of you know in Christ there is therefore now no condemnation? In fact, the beginning of this chapter says that. It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession. What's the next word? Not against us, for us. He's on your side. He's on my side. Say, whoa. Oh, you, you, you have to do it with a real deep gutter. Of, whoa. Oh, there you're getting it. There you're getting it. Look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Or, excuse me, the love of Christ. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or maybe not having enough, famine? Maybe nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are accounted, or, or for uh, thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Well, he answers that, no, verse 37, in all these things, in all these things, oh, we are not going to be whenever we, we overcome all these things, right in the middle of all these things, not in the absence of all these things. Well, if the devil would leave me alone, I could have the victory. No, you got to have the victory in all these things. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Whoa! For I am persuaded. How many of you need to get to? The, how many of you know we need to get to that point right there? And it doesn't happen by not, you know, putting our nose and our mind and our eyes on the Word. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. <laughs> the Amplified says, whenever it says there, things to come. Let me see if I can find that real quick here. 
The Amplified says something about things impending. It's here somewhere. Do you have it right there, Ann? Maybe you usually pull up the Amplified. Here it is. Nor things impending or threatening, nor things to come. Anybody got anything out there coming on, coming on the calendar? It's coming closer and closer. <laughs> things, uh, King James again, I am persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, things present nor things to come, things impending. Well, I got a court date. Come on. Nor things to come. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature or creation. Nothing. No one. Nothing. No being. No trouble. No demon. Nothing. No other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whoa. We got it made for life, man. We, we set. We set. We, we got it made for eternity. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're in like Flynn. He's on our side, and there's nothing that can keep him from working for us. He makes intercession for us. He's on our side. Whoa. Amen. So really, notice he said, I am persuaded. Verse 38, I am persuaded. That's a faith word. If you look up faith, uh, faith is of the heart. Faith is of, uh, we, we act on our faith to put it into action, but uh, it has to be a persuasion of heart. We have to believe something in our heart. And, uh, but it's, uh, it's of our heart. It's of, if we put it in our mouth and so forth. But um, he said here, I am persuaded. The word faith, if you look up, the word faith it'll say persuasion conviction being sure being certain something like that so um, he said I am persuaded so really what he's saying here he's given us a list of things that faith overcomes you, you can overcome any of these things by faith in other words he said not when I when I am persuaded that none of these things can separate me from the love of God he's basically basically saying that faith keeps these things uh, from coming between you and the love of God he said I'm persuaded nothing can separate us now when you look up the word separate it means to force apart or put an intervening barrier between you and something to, to, to disconnect you from it. So he's saying nothing can intervene between me and the love of God, you and the love of God, that uh, can put a barrier between us and disconnect us from, from God's love. Isn't that right? Bible in basic English says, who will come between us and the love of Christ? And so he's saying no hardship, no trial, no temptation, none of these things can come between us and the supply that love has made for us to overcome all these things. There's something, there's a supply for us against everything Satan throws at us. Hallelujah. Now, but get this, the presence of these things does not equal them separating us from the love of God. You got to get that. These things being present don't, does not mean they have separated you from the love of God. Because, you know, they have been present before in all of our lives. Isn't that right? But he said they can't separate you. Their presence cannot separate you. In other words, there, um, only the absence of faith can. Notice this verse does not mention unbelief. He said, I'm persuaded that unbelief can't separate me from the love of God. He didn't say that. Unbelief's not on the list. Well, you ever thought about that? So we got to understand that separation from the love of God is something that the absence of faith allows to happen. That, faith, that love is still directed toward us. But we put up something to block God. The Bible says in the Old Testament 
that uh, the Israelites turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. God can be limited. But it's not uh, the test or the trials that keeps him from getting us through to the other side. That's nothing. That's a piece of cake. All these things listed are a piece of cake to faith. You understand? They're, they're as nothing. They have no power. They've been defeated. They are from the one who's been defeated. Amen. Separation from the love of God is something that the absence of faith allows to happen. Amen. The presence of these things alone can't keep you or separate you from the love of God. They don't have that kind of authority. They've been stripped of that kind of authority. Amen. But notice he didn't say, I'm persuaded that unbelief uh, can't separate me from the love of God. Because it can. Isn't that right? God still loves us and still has a supply for us in, an, in, a, in a place that we're in unbelief. But we've cut ourselves off from it. We've separated ourselves from it. We've put up a barrier. We've blocked it. Isn't that right? And so, um, so I want to look at these passages of Scripture because the Lord started talking to me about something whenever I woke up. <clears throat> and, and I want you to notice verse 35 here. And he said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he goes through this list. In other words, that none of these things can, just them themselves can, but he's asking a question, who can separate us from the, uh, the, these things? And then verse 37, he says, Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved him. Or, or him that loved us, excuse me. So notice, he didn't say in the absence of all these things, we're more than conquerors. We as faith people have got to come to the place where we stop waiting for the devil to leave us alone, to stop yakety-yak-yak and telling us you're not going to make it before we, we believe God. And we believe we can, we can uh, succeed. Now, way, the way I was looking at this, the way was, he said in verse 37 again, in all these things we're more than conquerors. The thing that the Lord woke me up talking to me about was, he was pointing this verse out, and all these things were more than conquerors. And then he's, he basically said it this way. In, he, we could say, in the presence of all these things, we are not victims. That's what he started talking to me about. And I hope you brought your, I hope you're ready for a, for a service tonight. Because, boy, it got strong the way he started talking to me. In the presence of all these things, we're not victims. Isn't that good news? Because there's so many things that try to tell us, well, well, I'm a victim of this. I'm a victim of that. I'm a victim of that person. They won't give me a break. In the presence of lack, we're not victims of poverty. We're not poor. In the presence of symptoms, we, that can't separate us from the healer. The healer doesn't separate himself from us because we have symptoms. Amen. Only we can separate that flow of healing towards us by, by being in unbelief. Am I making any sense tonight? So the presence of any of the devil's works doesn't equal you being defeated. Uh, they don't make you a victim. In other words, only you and I can assume that status victim status by taking a victim mentality in our heart and mind because of what the enemy brought amen that's what defeats people amen not the presence of any of these works of the devil so we should stop believing that we're a victim so readily and uh <clears throat> rather than doubting and believing the worst you know something bad comes we start, you know, we start, we start getting a little tight financially or something or, 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 you know, something starts going wrong in life, some area of relationships or something, and we start believing, oh, here it comes. Oh, my, oh, and believing the words. Oh, it's on, uh, uh, this thing keeps coming around. I'm such a victim of this thing. I, stop believing the worst. I said, stop so readily believing the worst and believe God's working His plan even though we can't see it yet. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, without going there, you know what it says. He said, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things that are not seen. 
So he's basically saying that we need to stop the diabolical habit of looking at things seen and believing it more than we believe the Word of God. That we can't see yet. I'm talking about the Word that we can't see yet. It hasn't manifested yet. But we're to take our biblical responsibility of, for, for believing God and using our faith and walking by faith in the unseen until our faith has satisfied us. Hallelujah. Are you ready to get into this tonight? Amen. Give, giving God what He, believing God and using our faith and walking by the unseen and faith in the unseen is giving God what He needs to work His plan for your good. Remember Romans 8, 27 says, we know that God, that all things work together for good, for good to them that love God. Now, a lot of people take that out of the context. The previous verse just talked about praying things out in the Holy Ghost. And when the Amplified says, God being a partner in their labors, all things work together for good. So when we yield to the Holy Ghost, trust in the Holy Ghost to give us utterance, to pray things out. And we give Him place to, to have, have a way of, of, of praying that out. How many of you, when we pray in, the to in tongues, we pray mysteries. And when we pray those things out, we might not see the plan of God. It might look like it keeps going the other direction. But we say, no, God's working His plan. We, we pray in the Holy Ghost. And He's taking those words and working with them to bring His, pan, His plan to pass. And when we do that, He said, everything's going to work out to get to, for our good. People take that and say, well, everything bad that happens, God will make it for your good. Well, He didn't bring the bad, number one. And yes, He'll, he'll take what the devil intended for evil and, and, and turn it out, we'll be ahead in the situation. We understand that, but He didn't bring the bad. But I'm just simply saying, why not believe that uh, if we'll use our faith and pray in the Holy Ghost, and if we'll speak the Word of God and say what He said about the situation, that we're giving God what He needs to work His plan out his good plan out for good. I want you to go to a verse in the Old Testament in Genesis, chapter number 42. Praise the Lord. God's got a good plan in everything that the devil's trying to stir up. And right in the middle of it, we use our faith, speak the word, pray in tongues, yield to the Holy Ghost, praise God, it's all coming to pass, what we're believing for. It's all. Then God will keep working, and the devil will keep hitting, hitting the power of God. He's trying to get his thing on, and, and we keep releasing the power of God toward it, and he keeps running into that wall, the power of God. And it keeps pushing him back, pushing him back, pushing him back, and eventually God's plan whoo, comes right on through. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. In all these things. <laughs> Look at Genesis chapter 42. This is, a, I think you know this story. I'll give you the context. Jacob... Uh, was the father of the 12 sons that made up the 12 tribes of Israel, that started the 12 tribes of Israel. And you know the story about Joseph, his, his one son, Joseph, who his other brothers, uh, you know, uh, sold into slavery. They told his dad that he had died. They, brought, they dipped his coat in, in uh, the blood of some sheep and said, well, a lion got him, you know. And, and, uh, but, and his dad, so his dad thought Joseph was dead, but really he sold into slavery. And he's down in Egypt, you remember. And then uh, they, get, they got to a place of famine a number of years later. And by this time, it's a long story, but Joseph had risen to number two position in, in Egypt. And so Jacob says, go down into Egypt and buy grain because Joseph had a dream. And remember the dream was there's going to be seven fat cow years of plenty and then seven skinny cow years. And so the vision was to, to instruction to lay up food for the seven skinny cow years during the seven fat cow years. And so that, they did that by the direction of the Lord through Joseph's dream. And so Joseph, I mean, uh, it, uh, Egypt had all this grain for sale during this famine. Well, uh, Jacob found out about it. They were in famine. So he said, well, he sent his boys down there. Go down there and get, get us some grain. You remember that? Well, they go down there, and Joseph's number two in charge, and he meets them. And he knows who they are, but they don't know who he is. Because he's probably dressed different, you know, and probably grew up more or whatever. And probably sounded more like an Egyptian now than he did, you know. But so they didn't recognize him. And so the whole story is Joseph recognizes him, and he wanted to, and he tested him. And he said, I'm going to hold, which one was it, Simeon, I believe? I'm going to hold Simeon, because they said, 
he was asking them, who, who, where are you from? And they said, so-and-so, you know, and, and uh, how many brothers do you have? And so-and-so. He said, ah, I think you're lying. I think you're lying. He's testing them. He said, I'm going to do this. I think you're down here to spy on us. I'm going to hold, I think it was Simeon, if I remember right, and I'm going to hold him as, as, uh, as a surety and guarantee that you really do have another brother at home called Benjamin. Because he wanted to hear about Benjamin, whether he's alive or not. And so he said, I'm going to hold Simeon. You go back and get Benjamin. Come back here and prove to me you're not lying. You're not just down here spying, you know. And then remember, he put the gold cup in there and accused them of stealing. He's, he's really working them over, man. And so uh, they come back. The boys come back with, with, you know, this thing over their head. They got to bring Benjamin back. And they're accused of being a traitors and liars and spies and all this. And, uh, and uh, they go back and tell Joseph, I mean, excuse me, they tell Jacob what's the story and what happened down there. And, uh, and Joseph, then, and then here's what Jacob said. Because he didn't want to, he lost Joseph, and uh, Benjamin was his next favorite. <laughs> you shouldn't have favorite children, but it, that's what happened. And then it said in verse 36, after they got this, they were told they had this uh, assignment to bring back uh, Benjamin. Jacob, verse 36, and, uh, this is Genesis 42, 36. Jacob, their father, said unto, the, unto them, Me you have bereaved of my children. He's mad at them. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not. That's down, he's down there in Egypt in prison. And ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. Isn't that what he said? What is that? Smells like a victim mentality to me, doesn't it to you? Oh, all these things. Oh, God, all these things. There's just one problem with his statement. You could write after that in big letters, wrong. <laughs> they weren't against him. It looked bad. But right in the middle of all the bad... God was working a plan. Actually saved him from starving. And yet he's, all oh, these things are against me. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody that every time you meet them, talk to them, they go through a litany of all their things. How you doing? Well, you know, the refrigerator went out and this and that. And, you know, and Aunt Susie, she got all stirred up now. And, and you know, my former husband, now he won't pay child out alimony. And just, and you feel like whenever you see them, you don't ask them anymore how you doing. They say, hello. Isn't that right? Anybody met anybody, ever known anybody like that? They go through an itemization of the listing of everything they're dealing with. How many of you notice those folks are always overwhelmed? Oh, go ahead and look straight ahead and say amen. We won't know it's you. <laughs> you know why they're overwhelmed? Because their, their minds are on all that the devil's doing. And they have a victim mentality because of it. See, that's a victim mentality. All these things are against me. That wasn't even true, was it? Well, praise the Lord. I'm going to be leaving right after this. <laughs> Everybody say, I still love Pastor anyhow. Amen. So they're always telling you about all the things. That, and the reason is because their attention's on all those things. It reveals that inside they've taken a victim mentality about all the stuff. Do you know all of us and any of us could go through a litany of all the stuff and so it's just not fair that you get to and I don't. Because I refuse to live there. You know what I'm talking about? People come in sometimes, they want certain counseling along certain lines, and I think, you know, I've, I've, I've been tempted, and I've never done it, but I've been tempted to just unload everything on them that I'm dealing with. They'd go out of there thinking, praise the Lord, my life's pretty good, hallelujah. My life is good anyhow in all these things <laughs> amen praise God hallelujah the devil so many people the devil offered them a job and they proudly now are employed as the devil's bookkeeper 
Well, praise the Lord. I said they're the devil's bookkeeper. They're keeping detailed act, uh, account of all the activity of the devil in their lives. They chronicle it. They write it down. Amen. Some even get promoted and start chronicling, if that's the right word, all that the devil's doing in other people's lives too. They do such a good job of chronicling everything in their life. The devil says, let me give you a promotion and let me just get, let me, let me make you my bookkeeper chronicling everything the devil's doing in everybody else's life. I got relatives that when you go to talk to them, how you doing? Well, Aunt Susie's sick and, and so-and-so's hoogamooga's worked up and, and you know, and so-and-so's about dead. And then, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like, is God doing anything? Amen. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. Sounds like a victim mentality to me. So some people, they, they became the devil's bookkeeper on their own, always doing it in their life, and then they got a promotion to the devil's bookkeeper and always doing it in somebody else's life, and they just give you a litany of it. They can quote it, recite it. I mean, they keep good records about it. And so the devil said, boy, you want another promotion? You're real good at this. I'm not only going to make you my bookkeeper, I'm going to make you my stenographer. You're going to not only record and, and recite everything I do, you're going to record everything I say. So the devil said something to him, and then the devil said this to me. Then they recited. it. Tell me I'm preaching good. Some of you don't let me know you're pre that I'm preaching so good. I'm preaching better than your amen. Well, praise the Lord. And so they get good at always reciting everything the devil says. And they make sure there's a good record of it in your mind. Have you ever noticed that the devil's not paying you real well? It's not going real well, is it? For all that time and all that work, keeping all those records, and what are you getting out of it? Huh? What are you getting out of it? Work your fingers to the bone, and what do you get? Bony fingers. <laughs> Somebody come to church tonight, would you? Amen. These are the way some people are, though. Listen. Listen. I, I, let's just keep it out of Spirit of Faith Family Church. What do you say? If you listen to that little voice down on the inside of you, it'll scratch you when you start going through your litany. And it'll start telling you, don't like the victim like that. Don't sound like a victim. Don't talk like a victim. It'll try to restrain you, get you to shut up. Stop talking like that. Amen? It's defeating you, and your spirit knows it. And it knows you're listening to a spirit in the spirit realm, just getting you to repeat things. I, I, I have watched people wait on the enemy for the next thing to say. You think I'm kidding. No, I actually have watched them. They, they, and you can just tell when their thought hits, oh, yeah, and they say the next thing. And it's nothing but a bunch of fear and unbelief. Well, hallelujah. Thank God. Tell your neighbor I'm preaching pretty good. He's, uh, tell him I'm, you know, he, he's preaching pretty good. Your flesh wants to have a pity party. Make excuses and blame others and talk about everything that's going wrong. Don't fall for the trap. Faith gives you the ability to say what will be and how it will be regardless of all these things. It gives you the ability to determine the outcome of all those things. But that whining victim mentality thing It'll ca cause you to just fall prey to all that. Amen. What the devil throws at you doesn't determine who you are or the outcome of life. Isn't that what that means? In all these things, if you're fully persuaded to this, you can turn it on, the, on his head and turn it around on him and make him wish he had never done it to you. Make him eat it. In fact, you'll feed it to him on a fork yourself. That's called a spirit of faith. That is still on our sign out there, by the way. Tell your neighbor, that's who we are. We have a spirit of faith. Hallelujah. What you say is what determines what's going to really happen. You'll have, Jesus said, what you say. 
How many of you know, though, the circumstances? They'll try to demand a response of unbelief. Well, yeah, see, look at this. So you've got to, and they'll demand. And people that, that, that are in unbelief, they'll try to look at you like, what's wrong? If you say something in, in line with the Word of God in the presence of all these things, they'll look at you like, you know, what right do you have to talk that way? Well, I didn't wait on the circumstances for that right, that's for sure. I got the right to say those things from God. I have the right to say in all these things. Amen. These things that arise have no authority to demand a response of failure out of me or a confession of failure. Well, look, there, there, there I'm in trouble again financially. And I just, I'm a failure. No, I, that, that has, that, those things give, they do, not, they do not have the authority to demand that kind of response. I can choose my words. I can say what God's Word says. It's not the devil's mouth. It's not the devil's mind. It's my mouth, my mind. And Jesus said, I'll have what I say, so I choose to say what He said so I can have what He said. Hallelujah. Right in the presence of strong pressure to say unbelief, the enemy's pressuring your mind, trying to get you to say you're whooped. You have a legal right in the kingdom of God to say what God said. Amen. And live in the supply of heaven. And in all these things, be more than a conqueror. Woo! Some things will pressure you and make you feel like you got to worry. You got to poke out your lip. You got to be sad. You can't, you don't have the right to be joyful. Look at your life. And you just go, ha, 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 ha. In all these things. In all these things. I said, in all these things. Amen. I have no more obligation to the devil, to me. I, to, to, to me, he's a dead man, and I'm a dead man to him. You got to get that revelation. I don't, there's not one single debt that the devil says I owe that Jesus hasn't already paid. I don't owe him a confession of failure just because he brought up one of these things or 17 of these things. <laughs> Everybody say, yeah, 34. <clears throat> I don't really care how many it is. In all these things. All these things. The devil likes the pile-up tactic. You ever notice that? And, he, and sometimes the more he piles them on, I just go, <laughs> that is funny. Another one. Ha, ha, ha. In all these things. Woo, you're going to get it before you leave here tonight. But uh, you don't owe any re duty or responsibility to the devil to make a confession of failure. Praise the Lord. So, back here in verse 31. Look at verse 31. We're in, well, you're in Genesis, maybe. Go back to Psalm. I mean, excuse me. Go back to uh, Romans. Romans 8, 31. Look at it again. Verse 31. What shall we say? What shall we say to these things? Say that out loud. What shall we say? How many of you know these things come to get you to say something? Isn't that right? They want you to talk like a victim. Sound like a victim. Poke your lip out. Have a pity party. Ask somebody else to bring you chicken noodle soup while you stay in bed. You know? You got to pay attention to your response to all these things. Listen, people ought not to be able to tell what you're going through. I, I just hate to break it that down. But they, you got to get to the place where the, none of these things move me. They, they don't move me to sadness. They don't move me to poke my lip out. They don't move me to beg. They don't me, move me to, to imply, uh, somebody help me, please. I got it. I'm a, I'm a faith man in all these things. Let's go enjoy an ice cream cone. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. If in all these things, we are more than conquerors, not in the absence of them, like I said. Isn't that right? So don't wait for these things to clear out of your life or move off the scene of your life before you believe that you're authorized to be victorious, to say that you're victorious in all these things. Say, in all these things. 
you're, you're just as much a victor in the presence of all these things as you are if they're not there. Because your victory is not dependent on whether Satan's working on you or not. Amen. It's saying what God says that removes these things from the scene of your life. Remember Mark eleven twenty three. 23, whoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed, removed. Think of that word removed. It means, uh, because it implies that something didn't go voluntarily. Say removed. removed. If somebody acts up in the service and tries to distract or hinder the service or something, we've got plenty of methods and strategies and things hidden and things that will cause you to be removed. We all look real nice, but we can turn mean and ugly. Some of you will sit there and smile while a few people turn mean and ugly. <laughs> Some things you don't know before you try. But that person would be removed from the service. Say removed. removed. That means they didn't go voluntarily. They were forced against their will. <laughs> Isn't that right? We won't wait for them to volunteer. Amen. We will remove them. Amen. Listen, a victim mentality doesn't move it. It cozies up to it. That's what a victim mentality, and, and, it, and it asks for sympathy. It looks for sympathy. Amen. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. The devil can't defeat a single ounce of faith. It, to him, it's like kryptonite. Faith is, faith is the devil's kryptonite. It just shuts him down like a bad girlfriend. You know what I'm talking about. At least you're not getting disinterested. <laughs> I had a couple of those. I shut them both down. <clears throat> Till I got the real deal, I'm telling you. <laughs> Amen. One of them took my pound puppy and wouldn't give it back. So I said, shipped her saddle home, man. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, well, well. Huh? She gave me another pound puppy. Yeah, she gave me. She gave me. We won't talk about everything she gave me. Okay, back to the word. Romans 8. But Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In other words, no outside. What he's saying is no outside force, whether it's demonic or human or whatever it is, nothing, no circumstances, no, no person motivated by the devil that created circumstances in your life that you didn't want in your life, none of those things can keep you from being blessed. None of them can keep you from being blessed. God hasn't set it up that way that a person can stop your blessings yeah. or a demon yeah. well they won't give me a raise down there at the job listen you can prosper without a raise or you can get another job yeah. nobody. nobody if you want it bad enough whoo glory be to God said nobody. nobody amen nobody can stop your blessings Nobody can stop you from prospering. Nobody can stop you from being healed. Somebody said, well, that person that lives with me, they just make me angry all the time. Nobody can make you have a certain response. Nobody can ruin your life. Nobody can destroy your day. Nobody, nobody. You're not a victim to other people. America needs to hear that right now. Young people, listen, your generation will push you into this more than even our generation did. The generation that's coming up in America right now, they, we, we got a bunch of whiny babies, and we got a bunch of victim mentality, and they want the government to give them everything, and they, they want, they, listen, they want everything handed to them without a job. You're going to have to, this younger generation is going to have to fight this thing more than we had to deal with it. Nobody owes you anything. 
And you're not a victim to somebody that doesn't give you something. Listen, if you've got faith, the devil, the government, somebody else can put you behind a block wall and you'll come through it. Faith is more powerful than the devil in them. The Holy Ghost will whisper on the inside of you when somebody says, tries to block you from succeeding or something. The, de- the Holy Ghost will whisper, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world or anybody motivated, motivated by he that's in the world. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Everybody has injustices done to them. That will not keep you from succeeding if you do the right thing with it. You and I are not to live all hindered, making excuses and acting like, well, if so-and-so would give me a break or so-and-so wouldn't have, you know, done me wrong or cheated me or this or that. Come on, tell me I'm preaching all right. God has not set this thing up that way. Your problem is not that person. Your problem is you. You let, and what you let the devil get inside of you because of what they did to you. If you wouldn't let that in, you could overcome. Rather than becoming skilled at recognizing what the devil's doing and not letting him trip you up, you develop the self-defeating, diabolical skill of making excuses. Boy, who wrote that? I don't know who wrote that. (laughs) Okay. Develop the self-defeating, diabolical skill of making excuses. How many of you know Pastor Nancy said people that are good at making excuses are good at nothing else? They are not. They're terrible at making a success out of life. And they're terrible at faith. Terrible at faith. Amen. Everybody has wrongs done to them, but some people just don't let that separate them from the love of God. Are you with me tonight? They don't let that separate them from what God's given them and provided for them. They don't take the bait of offense and bitterness and, 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 listen, getting in the streets and rioting and... That's a victim. They're a bunch of victim mentality people out there. You and I had no business thinking like that. More and more people are getting fed up with it. Amen. You and I are to take the idea that that attitude just isn't worth it. There's too many opportunities set before us by God. Amen. To get distracted by bitterness, being upset at how somebody treated us. We got too much to reach for in God to be all distracted by all that. We got too much a drive to succeed, to make some little person reduce us down also to a little person. Where we're fighting people and addressing, you know, all the hurts and things that people did us wrong. Decide you're not going to be so small-minded because of a wrong done to you by someone else who's small-minded. Amen. Neither demons nor humans nor circumstances or lack of opportunities, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Listen, get in faith and start, start believing God for some opportunities. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for the Word. You're just handing the devil the keys. Whenever a person goes down that road, you hand the devil the keys to lock you up. You really lock yourself up. Isn't that right? Deal with pity parties real hard. I said deal with in your life. Deal with pity parties real hard. Don't let yourself sit around pity parties and feeling sorry for yourself and making excuses and being a victim and whining and asking for people to feel sorry for you. I said, come on now. Tell me I'm preaching all right. Here's something you need to know. When you start feeling sorry for yourself, the devil's working on you. The devil is working on you. Mark 10, 50, blind Bartimaeus, whenever he got to the place, he heard that Jesus was coming by. He said he heard that it was Jesus. He took that garment that said he was a blind man and threw it away. Isn't that right? That garment was his identification of a blind man. Isn't that right? He's a blind man. He's a beggar. He can't work for a living. He's got to beg for a, He's got to depend on other people. Isn't that right? 
That Coke that said, give to me, help me, I'm a victim, he threw it away. Why? Because he had a revelation of who was coming down the road. Listen, when you and I get a revelation of who Jesus is and who he is in us and who we are, greater is he that's in us and he that's in the world, we'll take that blind victim mentality thing and throw it away. Amen. We got a revelation that trumped everything. It trumped everything. How many of you know the revelation he got trumped blindness? It trumped his dependence on other people. That low place of living. Are you with me? Are you out there? He had a revelation identity, not a situation identity. He threw away that situation identity and, uh, because a situation identity doesn't accurately tell you who you are. You got to look in this book to know who you are. Can you see it? And you know, a lot of times whenever we get upset at other people, we're missing the mark anyway. It's like beating the air, so to speak. Being bitter at people that did us wrong and did this and don't do this for me and they owe me this and so forth and so on. Rather than get angry at them, get angry at God, why don't you get angry at yourself for letting the devil get to you like that? Can you say amen? I never get mad at a person that does me wrong. I got, I got mad at myself for not following the Holy Ghost and letting it, giving them that opportunity. Well... Tell your neighbor, it's tight in here tonight. I'm on oxygen right now. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. I'll tell you, you got you to deal with this stuff strong. Deal with it like it is. If you, knew the, if you knew what's connected to it, you'll deal with it real, real strong. Well, praise the Lord. We live in a blame everybody else society. We're, I mean, our society, not we, but our society, big on lawsuits. I, that my favorite one is the, is the I drive through McDonald's drive through line and I drink the coffee and I burn my mouth. Your mama didn't raise you right. Something ain't, something ain't right with you. Can you see what I'm talking about? Thinking like that? That's the thinking of a loser. A person like that will always be hindered always be hindered I said they'll always be hindered the devil is free to completely control a person like that you can control their mindset and they will always have a reason for failure always they can have opportunity right in front of them and they'll have an excuse for why they can't do it amen the devil keeps giving them the reason amen praise the Lord we're getting it out of us. Tell your neighbor we're getting it out of us. This, just, this stuff just keeps people from walking in faith. Well, so-and-so didn't do me right. Well, you weren't supposed to make them your source anyway. Your source is heaven. Your source is God. Amen. Hallelujah. The devil's always standing by people who have a victim mentality, offering them a continuous stream of excuses to their mind to keep them distracted from walking by faith in God. That's what gives them the victory. But listen, people that always have a victim mentality, the uh, oppression, hindrance, demons, and things of that nature will always be their companion. You get around them, you'll sense all three of them. You'll sense hindrance, oppression, and demons. Because Satan runs with that. That's an open door to him. He runs, he hears that, he hears whine and he hears excuses, he hears a victim mentality, and he runs to that because to him, that's the sound of weakness. And he's a predator and he's going for weakness. Amen. Let's talk, let's make a sound that sounds something different. Let's make a sound that makes him quake in his boots. A sound that makes him, makes him fear that we got a hold of the revelation of who we are in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's stop making excuses. What do you say? Well, they didn't recognize me, or they won't give me a raise, or they won't let me on the platform, or they won't give me a promotion in the helps ministry. Or, Well, maybe it's because of that. <laughs> I'm just mean on the devil, not on you. 
Faith doesn't sound all hindered like that. Maybe we don't want unbelief in leadership. Well, Pastor, who are you mad at? Nobody. I'm, I'm just hitting the devil. That's who I'm hitting. Faith doesn't have the sound of difficulty in your voice. It doesn't have the sound of, you know, a victim. It has the sound of power. It has the sound of boldness. It has the sound of encouragement. It has the sound of excitement about the future. Hallelujah. And it doesn't, make, it doesn't want people to feel sorry for them. <clears throat> Amen. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I, I know the devil is the one that makes people invalids or crippled in wheelchairs and so forth. But it always, and I'm not, and I, and I'm, you know, I want people to receive their healing, healing. So, but, but it always blesses me when I see people in that condition who don't act like a victim. You know what I'm talking about? I see some of those people, and they are out there. They're a producer in our society, and they're, and they're going for it. It is the coolest thing. I'm not saying, you know, that I'm not saying God doesn't have something better for them. He has healing for all of us, doesn't he? Thank God. But I'm just simply saying, that blesses me whenever I see people that are in those kind of conditions, but they don't act like a victim. Doesn't mean they don't receive help or something, but they just don't, they don't expect everybody to give them a handout. Amen. Well, praise God. Now, I've tried to help a number of people that, that just are bound with this thing, what I'm talking about tonight. And I've learned by experience um, that uh, a lot of times you go to try to help some of these people, and they'll bite you. They'll just flat bite you. I could say something right now that would nail this thing to the wall and everybody in here would almost gasp. But it's, a, it's becoming a major epidemic in our culture. I'm not going to say it because some people wouldn't understand it. But it's a major accusation. You, you tell the truth to them and they, they throw an accusation at you. Because they don't want to hear the truth. Because they want to stay a victim. And listen, I have learned I have learned that, that, that a lot of these people will bite you, and the reason is it's more than a mentality. This is demonic. It has just flat gone demonic. Tell your neighbor, he's preaching all right. It's demonic. Because what you say to them puts the responsibility back on them where it belongs. And they don't want the responsibility on them. They want to be a victim. They want to blame everybody else. I'm telling you the truth. We've got to suck it up. Even though it's the truth, we've got to suck it up. It's a form of idolatry. This is their God. Don't touch my God. I'm a victim. This is, I'm putting this up on a pedestal. You touch this and you will get chewed up. Come on, tell me I'm preaching all right. I'm telling you, if you knew how diabolical it was and what it's going to do to this culture if we don't get a hold of it, you would be as angry at it as the Spirit of God's coming through me to, against it tonight. Amen. Now, let me wrap this up. There's one thing that will wash this out of people, and that is what it says in the book of Acts, chapter number 19, verse number 20. So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. The Word has the power to wash this out of us, to prevail over all this stuff. But see, some people don't want to hear the Word. <clears throat> like I said, it puts the responsibility back on them. Um, there are reasons that farmers plant their crop and then they till between the rows or they spray weed control between the rows and stuff. It's because if that gets in there and starts competing for the moisture and the sunlight ahead of the crop, it'll shade out the crop, it'll take the moisture away from the crop, and it'll greatly diminish the productivity. And so you and I have got to give the Word its proper place, and we have got to be like a farmer... And, and deal with all these other things that try to keep us from taking a hold of the Word and letting that, getting that Word really real, well-rooted and grounded in us. Amen? So mightily grew the Word and what? Prevailed. There's only one thing that will prevail over this thing. There's only one answer for the United States of America, for victims. 
And that is getting the Word of God on the inside of it. It's not in politics. It is not in politics. I believe we ought to believe God for good government. We ought to be people of prayer. We ought to be people who exercise our authority. But listen, my source is heaven itself. Amen. And we've got to get our faith in God. One group of politicians, their faith is, they, they teach faith in government. Another group of politicians, they teach faith in yourself. My God, my Bible teaches me faith in God. Amen. Amen. And so it says, so gradually, mightily grew the word and prevailed. The word prevailed is translated, uh, excuse me, the, the, the opposite of the word prevailed in the Greek, I did a study on this one time, is basically translated throughout the New Testament, I can't. So Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That only happens as that truth gets in you and me and prevails. I can do. Whenever people say, well, I can't because of so-and-so. No, I can do. Not regardless of, in all these things. In all these things. I am not a victim to any person. I am not a victim to any person. You know, there's a lot of people that will see you the way you see yourself. Until you see yourself as can do. Until the Word gets in you and causes you on the inside to be a person that prevails. I can do all things. And if you don't get that in you and you still act like a victim, people will see you as a victim. You're going to have to lead out in this. If you want chances, you want opportunities, you start believing that I am more than a conqueror. I, I, I have favor. Open doors. God gives me opportunities. And I have favor and people give me opportunities. It's got to start on the inside of the person. A lot of people aren't renewed enough in their mind to see that about you before you see that about yourself. So if you want it to come to pass, you've got to get it on the inside of you. And act like that's who I am. Act like I'm, I'm somebody going somewhere to happen. Don't wait for other people to see it. You get it on the inside of you. People that Aren't you thankful for people that do see that about you before you even do? But there's a lot of people that don't. I said, there's a lot of people that don't. Amen. Boy, I did it. I preached myself happy tonight. I am off the hook. I will not go home and God call me a wimp. <laughs> Amen. And we're, how many of you know we're not mad at anybody? We're dealing with a mentality. And really, we're dealing with some things in the spirit realm. I don't know if you can tell that tonight. We're dealing. This is going out beyond here. And we're addressing the spirit realm tonight. Glory to God. We're not weak. We're not a failure. We're not losers. We're, we're not people that don't have opportunities. We're not victims. We're more than conquerors. Woo, glory be to God. In other words, when things come against us that say we can't, we just conquer it. We just overcome it. That's, our, that's the way we flow. That's the way we roll. We, we're rolling with God. And with God, all things are possible. 